Lesson 6 Inside Out Sabbath Afternoon August 3 From its earliest years, the Jewish child was surrounded with the requirements of the rabbis. Rigid rules were prescribed for every act, down to the smallest details of life. Under the synagogue teachers, the youth were instructed in the countless regulations which, as Orthodox Israelites, they were expected to observe. But Jesus did not interest himself in these matters. From childhood, he acted independently of the rabbinical laws. The scriptures of the Old Testament were his constant study, and the words, Thus saith the Lord, were ever upon his lips. As the condition of the people began to open to his mind, he saw that the requirements of society and the requirements of God were in constant collision. Men were departing from the Word of God and exalting theories of their own invention. They were observing traditional rites that possessed no virtue. Their service was a mere round of ceremonies. The sacred truths it was designed to teach were hidden from the worshippers. He saw that in their faithless services they found no peace. They did not know the freedom of spirit that would come to them by serving God in truth. Jesus had come to teach the meaning of the worship of God, and he could not sanction the mingling of human requirements with the divine precepts. The Desire of Ages, page 84 To the multitude, and afterward more fully to his disciples, Jesus explained that defilement comes not from without, but from within. Purity and impurity pertain to the soul. It is the evil deed, the evil word, the evil thought, the transgression of the law of God, not the neglect of external man-made ceremonies that defiles a man. The disciples noted the rage of the spies as their false teaching was exposed. Hoping that he might conciliate the enraged officials, they said to Jesus, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. The customs and traditions so highly valued by the rabbis were of this world, not from heaven. However great their authority with the people, they could not endure the testing of God. Every human invention that has been substituted for the commandments of God will be found worthless. The Desire of Ages, pages 397 and 398. The substitution of the precepts of men for the commandments of God has not ceased. Even among Christians are found institutions and usages that have no better foundation than the traditions of the fathers. Such institutions, resting upon mere human authority, have supplanted those of divine appointment. Men cling to their traditions and revere their customs and cherish hatred against those who seek to show them their error. In this day, when we are bidden to call attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, we see the same enmity as was manifested in the days of Christ. The Desire of Ages, page 398. Sunday, August 4. Human Traditions versus God's Commands. Among the observances most strenuously enforced was that of ceremonial purification. A neglect of the forms to be observed before eating was accounted a heinous sin, to be punished both in this world and in the next, and it was regarded as a virtue to destroy the transgressor. The rules in regard to purification were numberless. The period of a lifetime was scarcely sufficient for one to learn them all. The life of those who tried to observe the rabbinical requirements was one long struggle against ceremonial defilement, an endless round of washings and purifications. While the people were occupied with trifling distinctions and observances which God had not required, their attention was turned away from the great principles of His law. Christ and His disciples did not observe these ceremonial washings, and the spies made this neglect the ground of their accusation. They did not, however, make a direct attack on Christ, but came to him with criticism of his disciples. In the presence of the multitude, they said, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. The Desire of Ages, pages 395 
and 396. The apparent zeal for God on the part of the priests and rabbis was a pretense to cover their desire for self-aggrandizement. The people were deceived by them. They were bearing heavy burdens which God had not imposed. Even the disciples of Christ were not wholly free from the yoke that had been bound upon them by inherited prejudice and rabbinical authority. Now, by revealing the true spirit of the rabbis, Jesus sought to free from the bondage of tradition all who were really desirous of serving God. Ye hypocrites, he said, addressing the wily spies, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The words of Christ were an arraignment of the whole system of Pharisaism. He declared that by placing their requirements above the divine precepts, the rabbis were setting themselves above God. The deputies from Jerusalem were filled with rage. They could not accuse Christ as a violator of the law given from Sinai, for he spoke as its defender against their traditions. The great precepts of the law, which he had presented, appeared in striking contrast to the petty rules that men had devised. The Desire of Ages, page 397. Let all who accept human authority, the customs of the church, or the traditions of the fathers, take heed to the warning conveyed in the words of Christ, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The Desire of Ages, page 398. Monday, August 5. Clean Hands of Clean Heart? Christ desires nothing so much as to redeem his heritage from the dominion of Satan. But before we are delivered from Satan's power without, we must be delivered from his power within. The Lord permits trials in order that we may be cleansed from earthliness, from selfishness, from harsh, unchristlike traits of character. He suffers the deep waters of affliction to go over our souls in order that we may know him and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, in order that we may have deep heart longings to be cleansed from defilement and may come forth from the trial purer, holier, happier. Often we enter the furnace of trial with our souls darkened with selfishness, but if patient under the crucial test, we shall come forth reflecting the divine character. When his purpose in the affliction is accomplished, he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Psalm 37, verse 6. There is no danger that the Lord will neglect the prayers of his people. The danger is that in temptation and trial, they will become discouraged and fail to persevere in prayer. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 174 and 175. Our Savior, who understands our heart struggles and knows the weakness of our natures, pities our infirmities, forgives our errors, and bestows upon us the graces which we earnestly desire. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, and charity are the elements of the Christian character. These precious graces are the fruit of the Spirit and the Christian's crown and shield. Where these graces reign in the home, the sons are as plants grown up in their youth, and the daughters as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. These heavenly attainments are not dependent upon circumstances nor the will of imperfect judgment of man. Nothing can give more perfect contentment and satisfaction than the cultivation of a Christian character. The most exalted aspirations can aim at nothing higher. Signs of the Times, September 9, 1886. Jesus spoke as one having knowledge and authority. The denunciation he uttered against the Jews condemned their formalism and hypocrisy. His scathing rebukes and denunciation of formalism have the same force today as they had in the days of the scribes and Pharisees and apply to those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. The God of infinite holiness cannot accept external service as spiritual worship. Those who worship God must worship Him in spirit and truth, or their service is vain. 
There must be reality in the religious ceremonies or they are simply pretensions, hollow abominations. But though Jesus rebuked the priests and religious teachers for their formalism and hypocrisy, yet how forbearing and tender were his lessons to the poor, the oppressed, the afflicted, and discouraged. The priests and rulers, the scribes and Pharisees, destroyed the living pastures and defiled the wellsprings of the water of life. By their false precepts they confused the understanding and clouded that which was clear. They misrepresented God by their hardness of heart, by their impurity, pride, and selfishness. Sabbath School Worker, December 1, 1894, Paragraph 4. Tuesday, August 6. Crumbs for the Dogs. The Syrophoenician woman urged her case with increased earnestness, bowing at Christ's feet and crying, Lord, Help me! Jesus, still apparently rejecting her entreaties according to the unfeeling prejudice of the Jews, answered, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. This was virtually asserting that it was not just to lavish the blessings brought to the favored people of God upon strangers and aliens from Israel. This answer would have utterly discouraged a less earnest seeker. But the woman saw that her opportunity had come. Beneath the apparent refusal of Jesus, she saw a compassion that he could not hide. So while there were many blessings given to Israel, was there not also a blessing for her? She was looked upon as a dog. And had she not then a dog's claim to a crumb from his bounty? Here Christ meets one of an unfortunate and despised race that has not been favored with the light of God's word. Yet she yields at once to the divine influence of Christ and has implicit faith in his ability to grant the favor she asks. She begs for the crumbs that fall from the master's table. If she may have the privilege of a dog, she is willing to be regarded as a dog. She has no national or religious prejudice or pride to influence her course, and she immediately acknowledges Jesus as the Redeemer and as being able to do all that she asks of him. The Desire of Ages, page 401. The Savior is satisfied. He has tested her faith in him. By his dealings with her, he has shown that she who has been regarded as an outcast from Israel is no longer an alien, but a child in God's household. As a child, it is her privilege to share in the Father's gifts. Christ now grants her request and finishes the lesson to the disciples. Turning to her with a look of pity and love, he says, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. From that hour, her daughter became whole. The demon troubled her no more. The woman departed, acknowledging her Savior, and happy in the granting of her prayer. The Desire of Ages, page 401. The Savior manifested divine compassion toward the Syrophoenician woman. His heart was touched as he saw her grief. He longed to give her an immediate assurance that her prayer was heard. But he desired to teach his disciples a lesson, and for a time he seemed to neglect the cry of her tortured heart. When her faith had been made manifest, he spoke to her words of commendation and sent her away with the precious boon she had asked. The disciples never forgot this lesson, and it is placed on record to show the result of persevering prayer. Christ's Object Lessons, page 175. Wednesday, August 7. Tongue Tied. It was in the region of Decapolis that the demoniacs of Gergesa had been healed. Here the people, alarmed at the destruction of the swine, had constrained Jesus to depart from among them. But they had listened to the messengers he left behind, and a desire was aroused to see him. As he came again into that region, a crowd gathered about him, and a deaf, stammering man was brought to him. Jesus did not, according to his custom, restore the man by a word only. Taking him apart from the multitude, he put his fingers in his ears and touched his tongue. 
Looking up to heaven, he sighed at thought of the ears that would not be open to the truth, the tongues that refused to acknowledge the Redeemer. At the word, be opened, the man's speech was restored, and disregarding the command to tell no man, he published abroad the story of his cure. The Desire of Ages, page 404. In the power of the Spirit, the delegated servants of Christ are to bear witness for their leader. The yearning desire of the Savior for the salvation of sinners is to mark all their efforts. The gracious invitation, first given by Christ, is to be taken up by human voices and sounded throughout the world. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The church is to say, Come. Every power in the church is to be actively engaged on the side of Christ. The followers of Christ are to combine in a strong effort to call the attention of the world to the fast-fulfilling prophecies of the Word of God. Infidelity and spiritualism are gaining a strong hold in the world. Shall those to whom great light has been given be cold and faithless now? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 43. He whose heart is fixed to serve God will find opportunity to witness for Him. Difficulties will be powerless to hinder him who is determined to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. In the strength gained by prayer and a study of the Word, he will seek virtue and forsake vice. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, who endured the contradiction of sinners against himself, the believer will willingly brave contempt and derision. And help and grace sufficient for every circumstance are promised by him whose word is truth. His everlasting arms encircle the soul that turns to him for aid. In his care we may rest safely, saying, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalm 56, verse 3. To all who put their trust in Him, God will fulfill His promise. By His own example, the Savior has shown that His followers can be in the world and yet not of the world. He came to do His Father's will, to seek and save the lost. With this object before Him, the Christian may stand uncontaminated in any surroundings. Whatever his station or circumstances, exalted or humble, he will manifest the power of true religion in the faithful performance of duty. The Acts of the Apostles, page 467. Thursday, August 8. Watch out for bad bread. Those who desired a sign from Jesus had so hardened their hearts in unbelief that they did not discern in his character the likeness of God. They would not see that his mission was in fulfillment of the scriptures. No sign that could be given in heaven or earth would benefit them. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit, and turning from the group of cavillers, re-entered the boat with his disciples. In sorrowful silence they again crossed the lake. Upon reaching the farther side, Jesus said, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Yet the disciples failed to understand Jesus. In their sudden departure from Magdala, they had forgotten to take bread, and they had with them only one loaf. To this circumstance they understood Christ to refer, warning them not to buy bread of a Pharisee or a Sadducee. Their lack of faith and spiritual insight had often led them to similar misconception of his words. Now Jesus reproved them for thinking that he who had fed thousands with a few fishes and barley loaves could in that solemn morning have referred merely to temporal food. There was danger that the crafty reasoning of the Pharisees and the Sadducees would leaven his disciples with unbelief, causing them to think lightly of the works of Christ. The Desire of Ages Page 407. The disciples were inclined to think that their master should have granted the demand for a sign in the heavens. They believed that he was fully able to do this and that such a sign would put his enemies to silence. They did not discern the hypocrisy of these cavillers. Months afterward, 
Jesus repeated the same teaching. He began to say unto his disciples first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. The leaven placed in the meal works imperceptibly, changing the whole mass to its own nature. So if hypocrisy is allowed to exist in the heart, it permeates the character and the life. The scribes and Pharisees were insinuating deceptive principles. They concealed the real tendency of their doctrines and improved every occasion to instill them artfully into the minds of their hearers. These false principles, when once accepted, worked like leaven in the meal, permeating and transforming the character. It was this deceptive teaching that made it so hard for the people to receive the words of Christ. The Desire of Ages, page 408. When we are able to comprehend the character of God as did Moses, we too shall make haste to bow in adoration and praise. Jesus contemplated nothing less than that the love wherewith thou hast loved me should be in the hearts of his children, that they might impart the knowledge of God to others. Oh, what an assurance is this, that the love of God may abide in the hearts of all who believe in him. One who knows has said, The Father himself loveth you. One who has had an experimental knowledge of the length and breadth and height and depth of that love has declared unto us this amazing fact. This love is ours through faith in the Son of God, therefore a connection with Christ means everything to us. We are to be one with Him as He is one with the Father, and then we are beloved by the infinite God as members of the body of Christ, as branches of the living vine. Fundamentals of Christian Education, pages 177 and 178. For further reading, Lift Him Up, God's Words Created His Works, page 66, and The Desire of Ages, The True Sign, pages 404 to 409.